That's Nick. And that's Joseph. And today we're here to talk about Corsage, the fifth film directed by Marie Kreutzer, which premiered at the 2022 Cannes Film Festival in the Un Certain Regard sidebar. Uh, as of this recording, it has been shortlisted for an Academy Award in the category of Best International Feature. Uh, it is being released courtesy of IFC Films, December 23rd, 2022. Do I know Marie's other films? You don't, but I am familiar with her previous film, The Ground Beneath My Feet, which competed uh, in Berlin in 2019, uh, which I felt kind of so-so about, but it is definitely worth a look. Uh, it's a kind of a lesbian corporate administrative thriller about this woman and her schizophrenic sister, and it, it has a very sterile look to it. But uh, And I also happened to catch this TV film she did uh, as part of some series, I think it was called Four, which I also kind of liked uh, some really great female characters, especially a detective played by Regina Frisch, who has a supporting role in this. Uh, however, this was one of my top 10 films out of Cannes this year, and it has, I think, a fantastic performance from Vicky Creeps. I thought this movie was excellent. I really related to the main character. It's based on a historical figure. Mm -hmm. So it's Empress Elizabeth of Austria in the film, mm -hmm. but historically she was known as Sissy. She's been played many times. Houston. No. No, not Sissy Houston. Oh, different okay. spelling. Uh, this is the char this, this is the characterization that made Rami Schneider a film star because she played uh, Empress Sissy, as is her nickname, across a trilogy of films. Uh, Rami Schneider also notably played her in a film called Ludwig about Ludwig II of Bavaria, who is also featured in this film. Oh, and her cousin. Yeah, by Visconti. Oh. It's an opulent epic, and Rami Schneider notably played her as an adult, actually, instead of just a teenage girl. She was 16 when she married Fritz Joseph. Uh, and she's also been portrayed uh, by Ava Gardner in Merling. Uh, and there's an upcoming film uh, about the Empress of Austria from the perspective of her handmaiden, I think, uh, with starring Sandra Hüller, who you know from uh, Tony Erdman. The basic story is very simple. We just focus on the Empress... Uh towards the end of her life, <laughs> spoiler, uh, in the late 1800s, she is just miserable. She's not happy in her marriage to the emperor. She is... She's just turned 40. She Or she's about to turn 40, yeah. Mm -hmm. She's just obsessed with like her appearance. She's obsessed with how people talk about her, talk to her, the things they say. She kind of becomes a recluse, um, and everything leads to her killing herself. So And setting up her uh, right-hand woman, uh, Countess uh, Fischtick, as her doppelganger double to pose as her. So yeah, so she grooms this one employee, I guess, to make public appearances for her. So the assumption is after she... Because the final scene is the Empress killing herself, so we would assume that this uh, double would proceed with her duties because she's estranged from the emperor at that point right because uh, in reality the empress of austria was assassinated about a decade after when this film ends so when we first meet the empress i knew i would like her because she is a literal stunt queen mm -hmm. she she goes she's not you can tell she doesn't like having to do these public things and the first one we see her attend she like has like a fake fainting spell mm -hmm. And it's before the credit or before the title card shows. So she fakes fainting. And then we immediately cut to her with her handmaidens, I guess they're called, like leaving and like running up the stairs mm -hmm. in slow motion. And then uh, kind of gleefully telling her cousin, King uh, Ludwig of Bavaria, that uh, how she fakes how, her how, fainting. Yeah. So I thought that was really good. Then we meet the emperor and it's clear that, you know, whatever they had is gone. And th th this is just a situation. Um, but I he, I thought it was funny that he was wearing face merkins. <laughs> that, like, that's... that he has taken off and put in a box. Uh, well, it's just, it's funny because it's like Kreutzer is showing behind the curtain a lot yeah. uh, about hair and teeth and uh, bodies uh, and how it's all, it, it, it's all and always has been a facade. I related to her character just in the sense of like having to, you know, like you get, like she's in this position and she has to perform and she doesn't want to and all the bullshit. And I think it, the film feels like 80% historically accurate, but there are sort of modern. There are knackers. Like, like the score, I think some of the details, but I, I would assume they were deliberate and they're not distracting. Like some of the architecture, some of the technology we see feels like 
maybe it was a little more contemporary than the time, but I think it all blends together very well. Yeah, like I think in musical choices, I think are nice selections such as like live performances on a harp of Marianne Faithful's uh, As Tears Go By, which actually and might have been the Stones originally. But I also feel like what the Empress is dealing with really relates to sort of like modern day celebrity mm -hmm. and her having to deal with people's comments, which are... You know, like the equivalent of social media would be like her going to events and people whispering to her like about how she looks and what people say about her. And she just has to stand there and take it. I, I It's a very interesting approach that I really, really like. It reminded me a little bit. I think I like Corsage better than Spencer uh, in tone and a lot of the choices made. But it reminded me also of watching Princess Di have to uh, kind of manage her weight and, you know, suffering from an eating disorder and always kind of being... Uh, henpecked at all sides, including by the media that, you know, loved her. So we see that the Empress likes to visit this hospital. And I got the sense that she cares about people, but it also makes her feel better about herself to see these sickly people. And also they compliment her. Mm -hmm. So the first time we see her go, she's wearing this like very like ornate, luxurious dressing in, in like violet, like mm -hmm. deep violet. And then she's passing out candied violets in mm -hmm. these very beautiful ornate gift boxes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and she's passing them out to these people in these cramped hospital beds just looking terrible. And one gentleman she recognizes from a previous visit and he is mute due to like syphilis. But she goes, you don't remember me? You told me I was beautiful before. <laughs> It's like the only reason she remembers him is because he complimented her, but now he can't because he's like. And some uh, woman, and some woman called her. A, you're like a fairy, and she like gets real happy and hands her. Uh, but you also get the sense that she's gazing upon what her trajectory might have been had she not been royalty, uh, at where her rebellion might have gotten her. Particularly a moment where she's looking at a woman literally locked in a cage, tied to a bed. Mm. You you can tell that she relates to that. So then she goes on another little trip and we see that she's having an affair. She goes to visit her sister uh, in England. With like a stable boy. Her rider. Her rider. Um, so then it's made clear that she and her, the emperor sort of, you know, they, they do their own thing. But I thought the stable guy looked like if you mix Benedict Cumberbatch and James Marsden. He had a very interesting look. Uh, Colin Morgan, yeah. There's a scene where her horse... It's, it's kind of ambiguous what happened, but we cut to the Empress, like, on the ground, passed out, and her horse is also on the ground, hurt. So they have to put down the horse. She's very upset about it, obviously, because it was her favorite horse. Well, it's like all joy has been, everything's degrading, has yeah. been taken away from her. Because they say she can't hang out with the rider anymore because it's inappropriate. So now the, the next best thing is the joy she has in riding horses. And now that's taken away. Keeping in mind that she has children and a husband. So she mm -hmm. can't find joy in those things, which is, you know, reality. Well, well it's also, the chi that's also being stripped away because the children are turning against her and her little rebellions. Her son is, you know, cast investigating her for acting inappropriately and as is her daughter uh, well and what's interesting is her son clearly wants to follow in the footsteps of his father the emperor so he's very much in line but what I think is interesting is the empress she's operating under the assumption that her daughter will gravitate towards her sensibility but like you mentioned if ultimately the daughter tells her like your behavior is not appropriate and you're actually embarrassing so I, like, I thought that was pretty sad. It, it's sad, and it's also kind of got that Cirquean melodrama, like, you know, how Jane Wyman's children teach her and all, treat her and all that heaven allows, or there's Barbara Stanwyck and there's always tomorrow. It's how the children are also kind of reining you in and how how bitterly you must feel. About but I that. think it's well done, like the, like, the telling of the story, because it makes sense that this woman might not find joy in her family, because clearly she is, like... Um, She's an outsider mm -hmm. amongst her children and husband. And of course, the only one she really gravitates towards, her cousin of Bavaria, is gay. Is gay. And a mess. And, and, and also kind of a mess. And but watching them together is fun. It's fun, but he also knows, he understands the wavelength. Like, you know, he understands her depression and, you know, the he joke. He understands the pressure she's under. And, the, yeah. but, but the joke is like, well, if you're going to kill yourself, do, don't do it in my lake. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so... At a point, she meets a young man who's an inventor, and he invents, like, motion picture. Uh, an apparatus that captures motion. Moving uh, pictures. Played by Finnegan Oldfield, who's a notable 
I guess more than up and coming French actors. So initially she's like, oh, I don't like it. I don't like my photo taken because she's obviously very obsessed about her appearance, mm -hmm. but she does it and then she likes it. So throughout the film, we get several little snippets of her on film, like silent film in black and white, like sort of being joyous and mm -hmm. frivolous. And there's one moment where she's like, does this capture sound? No. So I can say whatever I want to, as long as I smile. Yeah. So then we get a scene where she's like, it's obviously she's talking crazy, but she's looking happy. I thought those were really nice um, details to the film. Yes. You can tell that Kreutzer has uh, kind of an affinity for the creation of this, this woman who's rebelling against the system. There's a moment where she has sort of a little argument with her husband, the emperor, and she gets upset and jumps out the window like she wants to kill herself. <laughs> but she only ends up with like a minor fracture mm -hmm. in her leg. So I thought that was like, whoa, clearly this lady is not doing well. Well, and then it's just like, we don't know what to do with this woman. So the doctor's like, here's some heroin. Then, the, yeah, the doctor prescribes her heroin, so now she's a junkie. Yeah. yeah. Well, and that's when she decides, like, I don't even, I don't even want to go to public I don't have functions. to make appearances, because my, my homegirl over here kind of looks like me. So, yeah, she's played by Katarina Lorenz, and she basically makes her start starving herself. So. And the first time she makes an appearance, uh, because the lady is not as thin as the empress, so they have to really snatch her in this corset. So once she's done with her duty, she runs back to like the dressing chamber of the empress and she's like sick yeah, because she vomiting. couldn't breathe. <laughs> I thought that was well done. But also the daughter, the young daughter's like, mother's being so serious today and taking her duty is... Like, taking her duty seriously. It's like, yeah, because that's not your mom, girl. <laughs> but but she likes that and she draws a picture and that's the only time she's really affectionate towards her mother. Um, yeah, getting back to her cousin, they have a moment where they're trying to be... She, I, I don't think they were, were intending to be sexual. I think they were playing a game where she wanted to know she was still desirable. Yes. But clearly he doesn't desire women, period. And, and I thought that... In it, I thought it was very well done because initially you're like, oh, no. Are these two cousins about to have sex? But then it becomes clear that it wasn't about that. It was about wanting to feel something. Yes. So I thought that was well done. And then we also see him take out his teeth. And what, there, are, there are moments where I think the humor works very well. Mm -hmm. Well, like when after the, after the horse dies, she's like, I never want to see my sister again. And she goes home and then she tries to have sex with her husband. and she Because she just gets naked in bed and flings the covers off. And he's like, well, I'm, I see you're unharmed. <laughs> There's a very sense of dry Austrian humor that I, the Austrians do have. I really related to like how everyone's telling her about how she looks and how she should feel. Mm -hmm. And she's just sitting there like, oh, well, like I couldn't care less. Like, why are you telling me these things? Well, the, the scene where she's, because she's not supposed to be smoking and she, of course, that's what she gravitates towards. And uh, the painter is like, oh, your complexion's changed. And then she's basically like, look, you can copy my image from a bunch She of gets mad and says, why don't you tell everyone to grab my old portraits and bring them to you and you paint me like that and fix my complexion then. And then the emperor goes, oh, I saw your new portrait. It's amazing how young you look in the picture. And now that seems also funny to me. But he's snapping at her because she's sort of insinuated to him that she knows that he's seeing a younger woman. Yes. Uh, but I think that seems also funny because she's smoking and she, her husband comes and she drops the cigarette and the maid picks it up and he's like oh finny i see you're smoking <laughs> i enjoyed it it's also she doesn't like people who drink because her dad was drunk mm -hmm. so then there's a moment where they're at dinner and some guy's drunk trying to talk to her and i also related to that like ugh, just well, don't even say shit to trying me. to tell her about how she should enjoy life because that's one of the pleasures of being human where would we have if we couldn't enjoy ourselves then she goes to the hospital at a point and She's looking at all the sick men and one of the guys who's like missing a leg tells her like, I don't know what to say to you, like the my, your majesty. And then he goes, all I know is I really love a cigarette. And it's funny because it's like all she needs is a reason to smoke. And so she gives the guy a cigarette and gets in the bed with him and smokes a cigarette. And so, of course, afterwards, it's like, I can't believe you did that. And that's when her daughter tells her you're an embarrassment. Mm -hmm. Um but, and you can tell that she's decided to end her life because she has like a lavish moment of like having more than one dessert. <laughs> it just, it's so just depressing. There, the doctor in the like asylum where she goes to visit, that doctor wasn't shit because every time she asks what's wrong with someone, his, uh, uh, what do you call it when the... His, his bedside manner? No. When some, when they diagnose, his diagnosis for everyone is so like, I, like one lady, he goes, she's, uh she's 
her sickness is adultery. She she seems harmless, but she's a real hussy. Like the way he describes these people. And she, the Empress is just kind of like, don't, wouldn't you love to read his charting? Oh God, yeah. What he's writing about people. I thought that was very well done. Well, even describing how they treat people. It's just like, yeah, sometimes we add electrical currents to the water. <laughs> then her doctor is telling her like, you know, you should take better care of yourself because the average life inspect the average life expectancy for women in your like kingdom, like your subjects, is 40. Mm -hmm. And so, then she looks at him and sticks her tongue out at yeah. him. Yeah, <laughs> she's actually very well preserved for which I thought, the norm. Which I thought was like, you know, you just gave me more ammunition for me to kill myself because mm -hmm. technically I should die right now anyway. Right. So right. I feel good about the, it. Because that's the whole meaning of the title is like, I'm only expected to last this long for this kind of occasion. And she's she's outlasted her worth in, in this situation and, and she's just reminded about it from all sides. But um, I really like Vicky Creeps. I think the only film we've uh, reviewed that you've also seen is a terrible film called Beckett. But she was, I think, um, English-speaking audiences... Oh, with John David Washington? Yeah. English-speaking audiences probably recognize her best from that excellent Paul Thomas Anderson film she was nominated for, Phantom Thread, or M. Night Shyamalan's Old. But she was in six movies alone last year. So she is definitely a hot Yeah, I really movie. liked her. Another... So I think the humor in this is very well done because it's, it's restrained enough that it still, you know, ironically feels elegant. Um, but there, towards the end the empress cuts all of her hair off and she has very, very long hair, which I was certain was like a wig until she cuts it off. Well, probably it is. In real no, life. I know in real life. I mean, in the movie, but like yeah. her, I mean, this character, I didn't realize that her hair was actually that long. She cuts it off. And then, um, the, the one like handmaiden who's responsible for her hair is like devastated. Cause she's like, this was my one job and, yeah. you, and you cut it off. And then the ladies are like, God, such devotion is admirable because she had such patience with you. Yeah, you're so damn difficult. <laughs> I, I I, really, I, I thought like how you kept saying that you think Kate Blanchett and Tar is aspirational. I feel like um, Vicky Creeps in Corsage. Corsage is my version of that. Like I really felt like I could relate to that person and like I would love for my life to be like that and then I could just end it when I'm ready. So I really loved how the story was told. Sure, I did too. Uh, that, like I said, that's why I'm like, I, I bet you'll like this film and you should watch it before you finish your year endless. But What would you give it? Uh, and notably comes out right in time because somebody in the scene because she's about to turn 40 right before Christmas and they're like, it's two days before Christmas. It's just when it's opening, it's two days before Christmas. Anyway, uh, four out of five. I would give it four out of five. I thought it was excellent. Anything else? No. Hit the thanks button. Listen to our podcast. Bye.